Hey everyone, I'm Kyle Rackey, and today I'm talking to Daniel D. Piazza. He's joining me on the show today. He's an American entrepreneur, an author, and a public speaker. He runs rich20something.com, where he teaches millennials how to make money in this changing economy. Mm. He's been featured in outlets like Time Magazine, Fortune, The Huffington Post, Entrepreneur, and Business Insider. And today, we are talking about building a platform. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Oh, that was a great intro. I'm going to steal that intro and just use it as the, as the lead-in for all my own podcasts. Do it. 20-cent <laughs> royalty on every episode. <laughs> no, I'm, no I'm really happy to have you. Um, and it's an awesome business name, by the way, rich20something.com. It, it, it will never get old. I'll get old, but the name won't. <laughs> you'll, eventually, you'll be 60 years old running rich20something.com. Man, I don't know. If I, if I had a dollar for every person that has said, what are you going to do when you're 30? Yeah. I would have hundreds of dollars. That was the business model all along. <laughs> yes. Yep, yep. So you're actually almost 30, but we're still well in that millennial bracket. Well, you know, the thing is, like, this is what I say on interviews too. Um, millennial, okay, as far as, as far as the term goes, isn't as much of an age demographic as it is a cultural time period. If you're working in 2017. If you're part of, the, if you're actively part of the economy, um, the global economy, you're a millennial because you have to adapt to all the technology, the ideas, and a lot of the same things that we're now learning are essential, like learning to use the internet intelligently, like learning to protect our time, like learning how to start businesses. Um, this is all stuff millennials are talking about, and it's not restricted to a certain age. No matter what age you are, you got to learn this stuff. Same thing with twenties. Twenty um, something is a mindset. I have seventy-seven year olds who have left reviews on Amazon about my book, saying it's like changed their life. I'm like, really? How much more time do you have left? Wow. <laughs> yeah. So mean. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I mean, I talk about Gary Vee a lot. I've become a fan uh, as of late. And, uh, you know, what really strikes me is when he says that he still feels 20, even though he's like 40. And, you know, he wouldn't have thought that when he was 20. He would have thought like somebody who was 40 was finished. But yeah, yeah, it's yeah. actually you have a lot more time than you really think. Well, I mean, I think that... Um, one of the good things is as as we get so a couple things are happening with millennials in, in our generation and just the world as a whole. I think the first thing is yeah we are extending our lifespans. We're getting older and we're living longer. Um, but I think also the quality of life globally, not for everyone, but I think globally quality of life is going up. Um, and I think there are statistics to support that in terms of like access to healthcare, access to um, food and water, access to medicine. Um, so I think that as those standards of living continue to increase, um, even here in, in North America, people are just going to start to have longer, happier lives. And so, yeah, you can be 40 or 50 and still be going strong, man. Yeah. Um, never too yeah, late I mean, to start a, a new business. It's never, it's never too late. It's never too late. Yeah. And so that's what you do with rich 20 something. You're, you're helping people make money in this, in these changing times. I'm very, I'm curious, what, what is your business model? So how does, how do you, how do you make money? That's a great question. I, I made a video about this yesterday. It was how the bleep does Rich 20 something make money? Because uh, I think that one of the things with this, this online entrepreneur space, which I don't even, I don't consider myself an online entrepreneur. I'm, a, I'm an author. Um, but the whole idea with making money online is very ambiguous, right? It's like, oh, yes, I'm t making money, talking about making money, talking about making money. Like it's a very, there's kind of like the Russian doll thing where like, doot, 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 yeah. you know, very, very inception y. So a couple of ways Rich 20 makes money. Um, historically and traditionally, we've made most of our money through online educational products. So lots of different material that we have. Most of it's free, 98% of it's free, and we have a small percentage of it that's paid. And so I started my career freelancing. Like you said, you have a small percentage of people who listen to the show who are freelancers. And um, about six or seven years ago, I started a freelance um, web development company. Well, I, I started off freelance web, develop, web developing, and then I turned that into a company. Um, and I started writing on that several years ago and that became so popular that a lot of my content moved towards the idea of freelancing, consulting, setting up service-based businesses, SaaS, things like that. And then I turned that into a course as I started writing about it and as it started to get more attention. And then over time I developed more and more different, different trainings and educational programs on areas of marketing, business and things like that. But then, you know, as that grew, then I got book deals and speaking stuff. And so it just grew into like this, um, 
this really cool platform that's allowed me to reach a lot of people. And I think that that's how we make money now, but I think that there's a lot of opportunities to do other stuff later, which we can talk about. That's awesome. I love that you, st- and, and uh, so so many times this happens, I think if you're smart, if, if you're a good entrepreneur, is you do a service business and then you find a way to make that scalable and, and kind of productize it, you know? And oh that, yeah, and service is where to start, man. <clears throat> yeah. It's a great foot in the door business, really. And then that mm-hmm. you kind of learn the ropes that way. Some people, you know, excel for the rest of their life and become, you know, stars like running the biggest, best agencies. But I think, yeah, so often you start as a freelancer, learn the ropes as, a, as an entrepreneur, and then kind of you figure out how to make that into some kind of product offering. Yeah, I mean, you got, freelancing is so important because you have to learn a few core skills that freelancing is a great entry point into. First of all, it's great because there's almost no overhead. You know, you have to have a skill and you find someone who needs it. You can start off pretty much for free. Um, building a website now is easier than ever. WordPress is basically level zero, <laughs> level zero in terms of um, learning curve. You know, a couple hours of couple hours of practice, you'll have it down. Um, so you can build something from zero. You can go get clients for little to no money. You can start off by doing some free work and getting referrals. Um, and you can find your you can find your skill set. And then you can also learn how to work with different personalities. You understand the basics of customer service and client satisfaction. You understand about like delivery time and how to like make things easier on yourself to become more productive and efficient in a business. And all this is like very, it's very good as a first time entrepreneur to learn these ropes. And uh, you know, Seth Godin um, a few years ago, he, he had some sort of talk where he was explaining the difference between freelancer and entrepreneur and he was saying they're not the same. And I would agree, but I would say like, just like in the in the back in the day, they used to say marijuana was a gateway drug to like all these really dangerous drugs. Right. I think I think freelancing is a gateway drug to entrepreneurship. That's Ooh, that's, that's perfect. A, yeah, that's that is like that one down too. that's going to be the quote in the title in the title <laughs> card for this episode. Uh, freelance the gateway drug to entrepreneurship. Oh, I'm going to write this down. Down, it's a good. You know, that's good. the way it was for me because I actually started my career as a designer. Uh, worked in agencies, learned web as sort of it came, uh, you know, became more and more uh, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the only game in town, really, early to mid 2000s, and then struck out on my own as a freelancer, then started an agency, then sold it. Now I'm doing a SaaS business. So like, yeah, it's totally yep. that's been my case and a lot of people that I know as well. Um, and you wrote a book called Ditch Your Average Job, Start an Epic Business and Score the Life You Want. Well, it's Rich 20 something and that's the sub right. subtitle. Um, so how did this book deal come apart? Because it's a uh, random house is the publisher, right? Yes. You can see my Wicked. giant book poster right here. Uh, yes, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, it's so funny too, man. Um, so ever since I was a kid, I wanted to write a book. It's a very, you know, it, the bookstore was always like a sacred place for me. And my grandmother used to take me there every single week, multiple times a week. And we used to like get hot chocolates and sit down with big stacks of books and read these books. And I, you know, we can never leave the bookstore without buying a few. And um, she was an attorney. And, and I used to fantasize about writing a book and think about what it would be like to see my name on a book and in a bookstore. And it was like definitely a big bucket list item. Mm. And um, so it's really cool to have completed that, that project. And you mentioned it's with, it's with Penguin Random House. They, they've merged now. So the oh, two they- powers have combined. They're the biggest publisher ever. Yeah. And um, like, I think it's really cool that I did a book with a traditional publisher. But I also don't think that anyone else knows or cares about the differences. Like I, for me, having a deal with a publisher is like a big ego boost for me because I'm like, oh, it's official. It's like a real book. It's in a bookstore. Like I got an advance for it. You know? Yeah. Because that's hard to else. do. I mean, you know, that's not an easy do. task. No, but I just, you know, it's just so funny. Like the perception on the inside versus the outside. Like when I tell people, they're like, oh, cool. Did you self-publish? Oh, uh, you know, and I'm like. No, no, it's like a real, it's like a, it's like a real thing. So I just, I think it's funny how like we put a lot of stock in, in things like getting deals with publishers and stuff and that's cool. But for the, what I've noticed talking to people is that they don't care about the stuff. They just want the book. They want the content. Yeah. Um, so for us, for you and I, we're like media personalities. So we think it's a big deal, but no one else cares. They just want to read the book. And you know, it's almost, I hate to say this. It's almost becoming less impressive when people say they've written books because there's services now that will do it for mm-hmm. you. You can basically just, you know, talk into a, a voice recorder and send that to somebody and they'll whip out a book and you can, anybody can put it on Amazon and it doesn't matter, you know, you can go up and buy the only copies of your book and say it's a bestseller. So people have found these ways to like hack 
being an author. And so now it's actually really impressive when somebody says, no, I fucking wrote this like myself Mm -hmm. and it got a publisher who's like distributing it, distributing it and paid me for like, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll tell you a couple things. One, um, and obviously I'm not going to name any names because it's just stupid for me to do that. But a lot of the big books that you see out now by that are traditionally published by big authors, those authors didn't write those books. Yeah. Okay. I think we all know this, but like you'd be surprised some of the books that you really love, the ones that you've highlighted, the ones that you've really built up like a, a, a fanship. I don't know if that's a word, a fanship yeah. for these authors. And you're really like impressed by them. Even the authors who do talks on their own books didn't write their books. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you'll also find that like the, a lot of the books that are, that are out there are, are just written as like lead magnets yeah. to, they're just, they're just to get more lead magnets into people's funnels. Business cards. I, I look at, yeah, the business cards and that's fine. And, and you know, I even had Tucker Max on my podcast and he's like, you know, the book industry is so saturated now. Um, and I think that's true, but I think there's always going to be a place for timeless work. Yeah. Um, you look at authors like Seth Godin. You look at authors like Robert Greene. These are people who are real masters at their craft, and they're not producing books just at, just as a way to get more people in their funnel. Yeah, they're writers. <laughs> they're producing, yeah, they're writers. They're true authors. So that's why I want to get away from the entrepreneurship space. Like in terms of in terms of me being an online entrepreneur, yeah, like yeah, I have an online business and we have educational products, cool. But I'd much rather move towards serious authorship than just like yeah, I have a book, but whatever. Like no, I'm serious about this. And we're gonna write many books over the next two three decades. Yeah. I love that. I'm actually, uh, after all this said, I'm actually working on my first one as well, but it's, uh, Congrats. it's slow going. It's a, it's a tough thing, man. As you do. Yeah, man. It's, 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 well, you know what? The book itself only took five months to write, but everything else took, you know, three and a half years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you have to actually build up the knowledge and, and expertise before you can like disseminate it. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to be the one writing the book, you have to, um, cause I wrote every single word of this book and, it, and if you're going to be the one writing the book, you have to have something good to write first. Um, but I think also, especially with publishers, man, everyone is so concerned with like, what's your platform? We talked about this before we went on air. What's your platform? What's your platform? They're so concerned with platform because big publishers want to be able to just basically buy your work from you and then have you distribute it. Like right. in terms of doing the marketing, they want you to do the marketing for them. It used to be back in the day. If you read uh, Stephen King's book on writing, which I highly recommend to every author or potential author, Read Stephen King's On Writing, which is his memoir of his career as an author, a career as a writer. And once you read that book, you'll you'll know whether you want to be an author or a writer or not. Damn. Because yeah, it's a really good book. I mean, he's the best. He's written like you know fifty eight bestsellers and had tons of movies, and he's the best. Side um, point: he, really he got blocked writer. by Trump on Twitter today. Did he? Today? Did he really? Yeah. Why? Why did Trump block him? What is it? I mean, why wouldn't he not block him? You know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Stephen King's been railing, and and yeah. as you would expect, beautifully articulate in his yeah, railing course. against uh, Trump, and he he's now lamenting like, "Holy shit, I got blocked by Trump." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you'll, so you can read his book, and you'll know based on how he describes the the life of uh, of being a serious writer, if, if that's what you want to do. But um, but I think that like. Back in back in the day when he was writing his books, in the very, especially in the very beginning, it was the publisher's job to take a piece of really good writing and like make sure it got attention, um, and so so that was part of the deal. But now you come to them, and they're like, "Great, how do you plan to market this?" And I'm like, well, "I came to you. You yeah. you market it. They'll put it in bookstores, but you got to come with a platform first, which is why it's so important that we do think about." the work we're creating as something that's gonna last forever. So when I talk about my books, I'm like 20, 30, 40 years, I wanna still be writing these things. I have a, a big ass book downstairs uh, with, it's Seth Godin's collected works. And it's like, um, it's not even his book, it's just his blog post from 06 to 2012. So it's not even all his work, it's just some of his work. And there's like 4,000 blog posts in there. The book is huge, it's like 20 pounds. And I think, man, this is what I'm talking about, creative output. You know, Tupac did like 12 albums, he did two movies and a book of poetry in the four years before he died. You know, we need to start creating more, putting out more work, seeing what sticks and developing a platform and um, a a library of intellectual property. And then it's not hard to market yourself because there's no way people can miss you. You know, I I really want to talk about this because you had some very interesting thoughts in the video that you put out recently about this. 
uh, about building a platform. And, and so it yeah. started with Random House came to you and said, hey, what's your platform, you know, write, yeah. writing a book. Um, this is something that it sounds like more and more people are working on, like building up their Instagram following, coming out with a blog, getting getting content out there. I think a lot of people are holding back because yeah. they just they're like, hey, fi- you know, it's fine. I'll kind of stay in the shadows and and uh, you know just just do my work and not try to make too big of a splash. Like they're almost right, kind of afraid right. of putting themselves out there on social media and whatnot. Um, right. Why is it important? I mean, you, uh, we all kind of know it's important to build a platform for reasons like this, you know, book deals and other opportunities. But what would you say to somebody that is holding back? Should they like climb out of their shell and start this? Oh, wait, can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I broke up a bit there. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so first of all, you know, social media is, Social media is a distribution arm of your platform. Social media is not your platform. The problem is that social media has an outward indicator of success and progress in the follower count. And that both helps to pad the ego and to give social proof. But it's still not the platform for a few reasons. One, because you don't really control or you don't own it. Two, because it's, re- it's regularly affected by various algorithms, meaning that your reach and the, the way that you touch your audience can be affected at any given moment. And really, at the end of the day, it's subject to, to space for, from ads. As new social media platforms move, move in, organic reach on each platform, whether you look at you know, Twitter, whether you look at Facebook, which, you know, you know that whole and historically obvious like drop in user engagement on fan pages when you know now you only get half a percent of reach and now we can see the same thing is happening with Instagram. This is the model. They build up a platform organically, they get everyone using it, then they take away the engagement and replace it with paid ads. Mm-hmm. So that's why you have to focus on building long form content that's going to last and that stays indexed. Mm-hmm. Um, so podcast, blog, YouTube. Now this is important because it's only 2017. You're so early in the game now and you feel like you're late. A lot of people are like, like oh man, podcasting, if I would have gotten in five years ago. If you would have in, gotten in now, in five years, you know, you'll, be, you'll be straight. I was at the YouTube space in LA a couple weeks ago and a lot of these big YouTubers were there. They're you know, four or five million subscribers, big, big uh, channels. And he's like, guys, you are still early. This is not even, we're, we're not even, we haven't even scraped this, this channel. You know, so I think that everyone needs to have a creative outlet where they're at the very least, you know, cataloging the things that are interesting to them and talking about things that are interesting to them. And even if you're a professional, I don't care. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, so I have things to talk about. I'm an author, I have things to talk about. But you could be, you know, uh, you could be anyone from a, from a waiter to a doctor and everyone has something to talk about. And it's important to have a place where you, where you create something. That's the point of being here. Like, why would... Now that we have these tools to create, why would you not? Yeah. I, I do understand the process of like not being comfortable on camera, not being a good writer, but maybe that's that's something that you're kind of reliving from high school or from elementary school. You don't think you're creative or good, but but I, I challenge you, especially as adults now, we don't have we don't have to um, we don't have to subscribe to old childhood beliefs. We can push ourselves past that because we're older. We're old enough to, to know that we can learn new things. So I'd encourage you, if you don't think you're a good writer, to start learning to be a better writer now. And I, it's really important because who knows what opportunities you'll have as you continue to become a more well-rounded person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just important to to be creating work, man. You know, it's <clears throat> this it reminds me so much of like how you know when there's a good show that's been out for say four seasons right let's say it's like right. house of cards or breaking bad or like some great show you All go back shows. and watch the first episode and more often than not it's not that good or it's hard right. to get into and yeah. it's because even the writers didn't don't really know what they're doing they're like they're putting something out there they're seeing how it works and then as the show progresses usually and it's like second or third or fourth season it gets really fucking good and people mm-hmm. get into it mm-hmm. a lot of people don't even hear about it they don't even know it exists until like the third or fourth season and mm-hmm. that's i think that applies so much to creating content on the web is like you just need to get out there and just start start doing it like you'll figure out you'll hear from people or you'll hear nothing and then yeah. you'll try something and that works and it's so much of it is just evolving what you're doing that you can't you cannot be great at the beginning you can't 
No, and also, you know, the idea of digging your well before you need it. Um, you know, you, you have to start now so that in five years you can be thankful that you've done that, yeah. you know, um, and you're, yeah, you're going to suck. Like there, there's no prerequisite around putting out good stuff in the beginning because it's impossible. There, there has to be a period. Um, there, there's a, there's a great quote by Ira Glass, um, who's one of, who's the producer of this American life, which is a really popular NPR show. And, um, and I, I put this in my book, but to paraphrase him, basically what he says is, all artists and creatives get into work. And by the way, to, pref- to preface this, I believe that we're all creatives. We all have things that we create. I put out a mixtape this year, okay? You can do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, all creatives and all artists have this gap between their taste, which is the reason usually why they get into their pursuit. They have really good taste in a specific area of creativity or specific, specific area of the world. There, there's a gap between their taste and their ability. Mm. And... It's very frustrating because it might take many, many years for the taste to match up with the ambition or the ability. Mm -hmm. And it's in that gap that most people stop because you think, man, I have this really great idea. I mean, maybe you felt like this. Mm -hmm. I have this really great idea, but I either don't have the technical expertise, the resources, or the time to like completely make this in the way I want it. So I'm just not going to do it at all. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people with creative ideas just don't do anything because they can't create, they can't replicate what's in their head. And they get frustrated because of that. That's so true. My my suggestion, and this is Ira's suggestion, is just keep producing work. Force yourself to keep producing work, and it's the process and the constant iteration and reiteration that will make you better. If you were to look at any interviews with some of the world's best directors, I don't know why I'm on TV, TV and movie kick. Let's let's roll with that. <laughs> if I, you if you ask the best directors or or hear them interviewed, Martin Scorsese, Quentin Tarantino, mm-hmm. um, old interviews with um, Stanley Kubrick. Never will you hear them say, I made that movie that I made, that was a perfect movie. And, and <laughs> no, I can never make no. anything better than that. No. They don't They'll even like watching it. their own movies sometimes. Yeah. And, they don't even like watching them. Well, the, they're, they're producers. They just like the craft of creating uh-huh. it and uh-huh. put it out there. And people either like it or they don't. Not every movie's a hit. And some people don't get it, whatever. But they're just like, okay, now I've learned something. Let's, let's, now I want to do something different. And, I, and I'm taking my experience and I'm learning from it. That's how we all can be if we choose right totally learn your craft learn spend time learning your craft because um i'll tell you one thing and this is something that uh, les brown says about money he says everyone tells you making more money won't make you happy but they still want to find out for themselves well the thing is with making money it kind of goes up and down. You feel like you want to make some more money, and when you finally do, you feel like you want to make some more. You're never quite happy. You always want to do more with the money. It's a, money is a thing where like we're never going to be truly satisfied, and then when we are, it's like, well, what's next? But the craft, the craft is something that's a, it can be a, a perpetual challenge, a lifelong pursuit of something that's fun and hard and intense and meaningful. Developing this craft is really one of the reasons I think at the core, why we're here. And your craft doesn't have to be something that's necessarily crafty, like, you know, I'm making paper mache or I'm like, it can be anything. I mean, I practice jujitsu. My uncle was a blacksmith. I know writers and authors. You can be a movie director. Um, Even even, even, uh, learning a new language, cultivating a skill like that is a craft. Hmm. I really think it's important for people to decide on one or just a small group of things they want to focus their life and their energy on. And it doesn't have to be related to your work. You don't even have to make money with it. That's not the primary concern. But developing a craft is going to make you into a better person. Um, and it's going to teach you how to have perseverance and how to and teach you how to learn over time. And that also has a lot of positive implications for entrepreneurship as well. Dude, I love that. I love everything you just said. Um, uh- rich20something.com. The book is Rich 20 Something. Ditch your average job, start an epic business and score the life you want. Daniel D. Piazza, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your insights. Thank you, man. All right. Any any uh, closing thoughts for, for listeners or, or watchers? Yeah. Viewers, start I suppose. <laughs> start, start now. There, um, there's, you know, there's this idea that momentum almost compounds. And so just realize that if you're feeling like you want to start, but it's slow and it's hard to trudge through in the beginning, momentum builds upon itself and you have to be able to just let that first step 
kind of take place, and you'll see that over time it will get easier. Uh, the spiral for success gets tighter towards the top, and it takes less energy to continue to work upwards as you continue to grow. So start with whatever your project is now and watch that process take place. I love it. And you share this kind of awesome insight on your podcast. You have a YouTube channel. Um, mm-hmm. I've even seen you've got mixtapes on your on Rich 20 something. So check yeah, out your yeah, music. Yeah, do it. Wicked. Thanks so much again, Daniel. You're welcome.